Okay, very good. Let's see now. I'm uh, I'm I'm checking out the uh, Facebook page. So watch live video. Let's have a look here. Um, pretty good. Ah, look at that. I can see myself there. So, okay. Hello, everybody. Look, we've had some technical issues, but we are finally a going concern. So, uh, Mark, Cam, and, uh, and, and, and Mandrake, you can all hear me, I trust? Yep. Okay. And I, I hope uh, people uh, having looking on the screen, stream can actually see what's going on. Okay. So we have had some technical issues, but by way of introduction, my name is John August. I'm the treasurer of the Pirate Party and welcome to our discussion on economics and housing. Now I'm actually, I'm in, in Sydney and I'm actually uh, joined uh, in uh, Kiama, I think you would be, Mark. So Mark is our ex-treasurer and has uh, contributed to our policies in times past. We also have Dr. Cameron Murray in Brisbane, I think it is. And uh, Cam is the co-author of the book Game of Mates, which is talking about corruption around uh, zoning, but also a whole lot of other things as well. And uh, Mandrake is also the uh, Master of Technology in Adelaide. So we, I guess we're all over the place. So, um, so if you check out the uh, check out the comments for this particular uh, video. We do have some discussions where I've actually had with uh, Mark, and Mark's also uh, been talking about uh, prosperity and growth and comparing Australia to the US. So I, I think there's some interesting comments there. And we also already had Tim Josling, who's been sticking his oar in, and uh, there is a past episode that's got some comments by Tim Josling. So, uh, so yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, housing and affordability. I think there's some very interesting answers to be had. Uh, Cam has sort of certainly got some things to say there. And I know I've had these discussions with Mark in the past and we'll basically all have uh, things to say. So there's probably uh, 10 uh, chapters to this session and maybe not after the introduction, but certainly after the other sessions, we'll check uh, if there's questions on the uh, chat. Um, on, on, on Facebook and perhaps we'll respond to that or maybe Mark and Cam will want, want to say, make their own additional comments. Now our plan is to try to get to the end of this after we've been talking for about an hour. I, I hope we'll manage to do that, but we'll certainly give it a try. But uh, you know, the, the idea is, I, I suppose, you know, Mark, Cam do have their own answers, but I guess I would say that a lot of our problems are caused by misunderstandings and there's some very fundamental misunderstandings and I think, I do hope that quite apart from policy, if we can sort out the misunderstandings, at least that's a step forward. And obviously I'll put in a plug for the Pirate Party and say that our thinking really is on the one hand quite enlightened, but also realistic, easy claim to make. I hope that will become clear as, as things progress. But uh, what, what are some of the segments we have? Okay, so we've got uh, uh, propping up the economy. Uh, why property values are increasing or why they have been increasing. Now, affordable properties, what the, the factors are behind that. Then we've got land banking and then talking about good things because I guess we're going to spend a bit of time talking about the bad things in the economy. Then there's CPI. Now, if people have been checking out the Pirate Party uh, YouTube channel, you might recall that I did actually make a comment on how CPI doesn't capture increasing land values and that's an important part of the picture. So we might well revisit that. Now, then we've got a history now, there I will actually be mostly deferring to Mark and Cam now. Mark does actually have some interesting things to say about even back to Menzies, when Menzies sort of changed things and, and all the our various uh, prime ministers along the way. And Cam does actually have some interesting ideas about betterment tax. And I think there's some changes in Victoria where they've got a vacant property tax and I think they've they made some other changes to the tax system. So maybe we'll hear more about that. Then we have sort of uh, answers and problems and reflections. And finally, just a general meander. We may well run out of time and energy, but maybe we'll talk about other things than, uh, than housing and, and, and so on. But let's uh, start off with uh, propping up the economy. Now, 
if you look at some of the international analysis of Australia, uh, where I guess they're a bit more objective than you get uh, in Australia, they talk about the Australian economic miracle. And remember, you had the Irish economic miracle, and you had the the Celtic, you, know, you had the the, the Asian tigers with their particular miracle. And what have people said about Australia that our growth is based on uh, increasing population and the development related to that pop population. So, um, of course, there's other people who point to our resources that we're just been digging the coal out and selling it off internationally. And, and maybe that's a, also an important part of the picture. Now, one of the things about all this development is that we have this infrastructure gap. Now, I've heard some commentary that basically when you have a growing population and you need to build so much infrastructure and increase your infrastructure so much, you end up tripping over your shoelaces because there's basically holes being dug everywhere, roads being pulled apart. And if you have a moderate rate of uh, growth, then you can actually get on top of the need for infrastructure. But I think it's as a good argument that we've got an infrastructure gap that, so to speak, we're mortgaging the future. We're basically just building, uh, building stuff, keeping the economy going. And in some ways, our quality of life is sort of uh, dropping. So... Um, so, and I would say that one of the things is that we don't have the infrastructure now, even it's a struggle to make it because we're tripping over our shoelaces trying to build it all, but we don't have the infrastructure now. So we say, oh, well, we'll build more stuff and divert some of that cash flow so we can afford it. Though, really, I think we should try to get on top of the infrastructure deficit without uh, sort of doing more, more development. But um, anyway, uh, Mark and Cam, do you have anything to comments to make there? And then I'll check uh, if anybody's made some extra comments on the chat. But uh, that it makes sense to you. Anything you want yeah. to add to that particular story? Part, part of the problem with infrastructure is we're not we're not necessarily just building it, but retrofitting it into cities where it was never intended to be. So it's very different. It's quite easy to have a proper rail network if you plan that into the city from the start. But if you're trying to retrofit really scalable mass transit networks into cities in order to keep pace with population growth. That's actually very, very difficult. Even even the most yeah, look, planned I, economies have trouble with that. Yeah, I think Sydney light rails are a good example of uh, the cost of retrofitting that sort of system into a, an established area. Um, but I think uh, it's probably worth introducing here some of the standard economic ways of thinking about this. And, and one of them is... Um, capital deepening versus capital widening. So capital widening is just duplicating the same sorts of infrastructure and capital goods that you already have. So for example, if you get 2% uh, more population and then uh, during that time you build 2% more houses, 2% more roads, 2% more everything, you've just broadened the capital base. You haven't actually deepened it. You, there's, there's no additional uh, stock of capital uh, for any individual in the economy. And Australia's, you know, probably been on a bit of a capital broadening uh, period in the last decade, but actually with the closed borders and a high rate of housing investment recently, we're, we're seeing actually probably a little bit more capital deepening. And I expect with the, um, the uh, trend of states and the federal government trying to boost economic activity through infrastructure spending we're going to see actually quite an elevated level of investment for for a fair time now so that, I, would, I would just say yeah it sort of also comes in waves so don't you know um don't get too bogged down in where things are now because these, these are long slow processes as the economy evolves Okay, well, I, I suppose I'll say, look, there was a comment from Jason Mead saying, where's the pirate hat? Whoops, sorry, Cameron's wanted to say something. Uh, no, no, that's great. I just saw it there. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry sorry if I cut you off there, uh, Cameron. I was, I thought, thought you'd finished. But anyway, Jason's asking where the pirate hat is. I thought I'd sort of uh, wear something a bit more conventional today. But okay, there's the pirate hat to keep Jason happy. Uh, that's one comment in the chat. Um, now, there are the, the few things from uh, Tim uh, Josling. Um, uh, okay, well, that, okay, we'll get to Tim Josling stuff later on. I don't think there's any particular um, 
particular comments about this section. So I will, in fact, move on. Um, so we've looked at uh, uh, basically the increases in property values. Now, I know Cam's going to have a few things to say about this, I suspect, but, you know, obviously these things are multifaceted and, and a great many things brought us to where we are in terms of what the property values were. And like since COVID, since uh, lack of immigration, property values have continued to increase and some people are wondering why that's the case. Now, I would actually say that uh, my understanding is that at the low end, where it's immigration that's sort of basically the thing that's pushing on their property values, that end of the market really isn't increasing that much. When we see this average increase, it's because of the investment at the top end of the market. And, um, you know, what, what's the cause of the investment at the top end? Well, even without population, uh, things are still um, happening. And Cam, look, maybe I'll, I, I know you've sort of spoken about this, but maybe I'll invite you to talk about, I believe our, our, our stories are compatible. I'm sort of saying that things are being pulled up from the top end, not the bottom end. And I hope that's uh, in agreement with your understanding of the yeah. statistics. But you, you had your own sort of explanation uh, for why I, things are being pulled up at the top end. Mm, I probably have a slightly different. That's 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 the what the evidence shows that the top end is rising faster than the bottom end in the last eighteen months. That's that's definitely true. But I think I have a slightly different interpretation of that because that that trend was also true in the two thousands boom and previous booms. In fact, all booms have a a sequence at which they occur and they typically arise with the top end and the premium suburbs going first, the next suburb geographically and the next category down in terms of premium, you know, standard or, or inferior, superior or inferior is the sort of terminology in property. Uh, there's a ripple effect through the market and it starts at the top end. And I, I catalogued that uh, more than a decade ago about the last uh, property boom, how it started in Sydney and it shifted out to uh, smaller capital cities and how it also within each city started at the top end and, and rippled through the market towards the bottom. So I think we're seeing pretty much the same effect there. On the immigration and housing prices, we, you know, it's never, the data, it's hard to see in the data that that's ever been a major um, issue. On because you know immigrants come, but you know not all of them have enough money to buy a house, and not all of them are willing to pay the price for the return, because the, buying the house is is like buying an asset, right? So if you've got other things to invest your money in, you can you can do that. So certainly there's a temporary effect on just pure population pressure on rents, and, and so, so there was, was a temporary, temporary effect, effect, but we, we didn't respond by supplying a lot of housing. The market's not, not you know, it's, it's out there to make money, money selling houses, so it did respond. But you know the, the effect is more on, on the buying. Is there a reason, for example, that new immigrants would, would buy property at a higher price than existing people and why would they do that? And I've never heard a great explanation. And so in May last year, I actually made the case in a podcast that property prices in Australia were more likely to rise 20% than fall in the next 18 months while everybody, all the bank economists, et cetera, were predicting 20 and 30% price falls. People called me an idiot. They said I should give my, back my degrees. Uh, I was blocked on social media because people thought I'd lost my mind. And of course, prices went up 20%. And uh, so we're actually miles away from those doom, doom and gloom predictions. And the thing is, I didn't account you know, I, I didn't think population growth was a big factor. And so I didn't say, oh, if we close the borders, prices will collapse because I didn't see it as a big factor. I don't see employment or unemployment a big factor in house prices either. If you look at the historical data, the evidence is just not there. So I said, hey, unemployment might go up from five to 10%, but it's done this before. And you know what? Prices have also gone up. So unless you have a good reason why this time is different, I'm going to also dismiss that argument. The arguments I did have were, were related to asset pricing. So the low interest rates that had already come down from 2017, there'd been a divergence of interest rates between owner occupiers and investors. That gap had been widened, giving owner occupiers uh, an interest rate advantage for borrowing. And there's just a pure cyclical timing um, 
the rest of the world had recovered from the financial crisis after a long period of time. And there was a lot of momentum in global property markets already in the second half of 2019. Uh, so if you add all those things together, it's very, very hard to see how it's possible for assets to fall, uh, asset prices to fall, you know, given that, especially in property markets where the prices move slowly and the ability of, for people to delay when they sell if they're worried is, is very, it's very flexible. The other thing that Australia had that's unique is that uh, we had the home builder grant which got a lot of people into new construction uh, a lot of investment in renovation and we had this real outsized stimulus the cash equivalent of the stimulus we had is about five times bigger than the 2009 financial crisis stimulus it was very um, unequally distributed towards business owners and, and the wealthy uh, into, if you add up the total of over 200 billion dollars of stimulus through various packages, including the savings on, on refinancing from existing mortgages. So there's a huge cash glut at the top end of the income distribution at the same time that interest rates had fallen. At the same time, unemployment didn't go up as high as we thought. At the same time, there was global momentum in property markets. So I thought it was, you know, you can't ignore this. Um, this, this is real. Um, and so that's what I said in May. And I think all of that has unfolded uh, fairly well according to historical patterns in the market. And, and if you can borrow money at 2%, why would you rent a house and pay 5% of the, uh, the value as rent? When you can rent money from the bank at 2%, why would you rent a house and pay 5%, right? Well, well, so that's the logic. Okay, well, Cam, one missing ingredient there, which uh, doesn't disagree with your story, but basically for all this hand-wringing people have had about the economy and the economic downfall or downturn, it would seem that there are a sufficient number of people with accumulated wealth that are still in a position to redeploy what they're doing uh, as circumstances change. In other words, there were people with money there's still people with money and they can get loans and, and continue to participate. So what I'm trying to say is for all the hang, hand wringing about, oh, the economy is going to collapse because of COVID, well, there's still people with money who are thinking about what to do with it, I suppose. For, for me, that's one part of the story. Yeah, uh, just remember the government created $200 billion and, and, and put it in people's bank accounts in the meantime as well. That certainly helps. And, and one of the big lessons I... I take from this period is that fiscal stimulus really works. If you give people money, it, it gets the economy going. Now, I, I would prefer uh, a more equal way of putting money in people's pockets. Um, Jerry Harvey, for example, with JobKeeper, got plenty of cash, <laughs> more than any under, other individual. Um, but it definitely works. And it gets the gets people spending, gets people producing, uh, and it's good overall. Okay, well, look, um, let's see, I suppose I, I will get to uh, Tim Josling's comments and Mark, maybe you've got some mm -hmm. things to say, but I suppose I can see some comments. Uh, M Michael says here, property values increase because the government restricts supply to increase stamp duty. And uh, Jason Mead is also saying, what about low interest rates inflating the market? Well, I, I think, uh, Cam, you have actually said, look, yeah. low interest rates do inflate the market. I think you were actually just saying that. So there's this yeah, claim here, property values increase because the government restricts supply to increase stamp duty. Uh, does that sound like a cre well, credible maybe, maybe claim? We'll just do, well, maybe we'll just do, do this out of order because land banking is, is one of the, the topics for tonight. And so okay. let's well, talk let, about let, that. Okay, okay. Shall, okay. We shall, we, shall we? Okay, let's wait till land banking because we've got Mark to sort of... Mark, do you want to sort of uh, stick your oar in at this point? Okay. I, I'm also a fan of fiscal stimulus. I think monetary stimulus has quite severe diminishing returns and can become the new norm if you rely on it too much. Fiscal stimulus avoids a lot of those pitfalls and is also, you can target it a lot more subtly and effectively. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of fiscal over monetary as a rule, though I think collectively we've gone the other way a lot in the last 20 or 30 years. Okay, well, well, look, I, I suppose we've got uh, Jim Josling's uh, comments to get to, which I think we'll probably do after uh, this section. But um, I, I suppose uh, one comment is about uh, affordable 
pro properties that I guess I would like to make is that developers are going to maximize profit and it's only under some particular conditions that they'll actually improve affordability. That's normally when you increase the density of something. Say there used to be freestanding houses and now there's a block of units and the cost per dwelling can actually be reduced. But what you're selling is now fundamentally different. You're selling a unit, you're not stand selling a freestanding uh, bit of property. Now, by some measures, you could say a unit is not as uh, valued or as wonderful as a freestanding property, but some people who don't like mowing lawns and maintaining gardens would perhaps prefer a unit. And also, at least on paper, you say that there's a higher development density, so it's easier for businesses to want to provide services. But my feeling is that's a bit indirect because businesses that do set up will set up so that people can drive to their location. So the idea that they will set up close to a, a, a bunch of units, well, maybe a bakery will set up there that wasn't there before, but I, I think it's not a, a strong effect. But, uh, you know, there is the whole thing of uh, negative gearing. And my understanding is that 90% of the money going through negative gearing is to make expensive properties more expensive because you only invest to get an increased return. As I say, it's only when you increase density that you can actually improve your return while reducing the price per dwelling. But again, your dwelling is, is fundamentally different to a freestanding uh, unit. So um, oh, sorry, a freestanding house, I should say. Um, now, the other thing is I know that, Mark, uh, you have some contrast to make between investment and speculation price and value. And I know Alan Watts was uh, talking about a dis distinction between money and wealth in all those times past. But for me, that well, hopefully you guys will agree with me that this story that, you know, you give developers uh, the, the opportunity to invest and it's only under rare conditions that they'll actually improve the affordability of property. And mostly investment is about making expensive stuff more expensive. For me, yeah, that's a fundamental part, link in the chain. And hopefully you guys won't whack me down on that one, we'll see. But, uh, but anyway, um, Mark, maybe you wanna make some comments and then tell us a bit of your story about you know, these distinctions between price and value, investment and spe speculation. Yeah, so economics 101 investment is increasing the productive capacity of the economy by adding the tools and the capital that uh, that unlocks that unlocks further production and increases productivity whereas speculation might be defined as just driving up the price of something that already exists it doesn't build anything it just drives up the price of assets that already exist in order to extract economic rent and the the problem is that our tax policies over the last 20 or 30 years have confused those two things. We treat speculation in the tax system as if it was investment and as if it was beneficial to the economy. And that goes right back. I think the best example of that was probably the Ralph tax review of the late 1990s, which under the guise of encouraging investment, reduced the capital gains tax by half on land. And that, that encouraged a boom of land speculation almost immediately. Uh, and within a couple of years after that, land prices doubled across Australia. And that, that then ran into repeated cuts in interest rates. And that, that created an almost unstoppable real estate boom that we're still in now. I mean, the, the price of housing in Australia relative to wages is pretty, by global standards, pretty crazy. It, it's not something mm -hmm. we can unpick at this point because too many people are invested in it but it does create a serious downside risk to the economy and it requires a lot of political capital to be constantly invested in keeping these house prices up. And if the problem is that you're, you're taking something that's essential for life and overinflating its price using by encouraging speculation. So you've sort of crossed the streams. It's happened with food as well. When food, the regulations around food trading were weakened and eventually the contracts around food became derivatives and other types of financial products. And when that happened, the whole food market became much more volatile and more influenced by psychology, harder to predict. There were repeated price jumps that led to actual food shortages and famines in parts of the world. And, sh and, and that, that's the same trend now that we're seeing with housing. Uh, okay, well, Mark, I, 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 
I, I suppose we've, we've sort of preempted some some other discussion that we might have had, but it seems like your your fundamental position is that speculators in a market uh, cause more harm than good because you'll hear sort of some narratives that if you have speculators, that means that if you want to exit, uh, you want to sell up your property and move somewhere else because you know life circumstances have changed. That means there's someone out there to buy your property, like they give you they give people who need it the flexibility of exit. So some people say, oh, speculators are a lovely thing to have in the, in the market. But I guess I'm preempting some of what, what you've said. But I think you're fundamentally saying speculators actually cause more harm than good in a lot of instances. And I seem to remember that while you were more or less comfortable with markets, you also had a bit of an adverse reaction to financialise markets. Now, maybe that's opening too much of a uh, Pandora's box there, but is there something you can talk about, comment well, on there? I mean, speculation's fine if it's on something like Bitcoin or on shares. You just don't want it to cross too much into the hierarchy of needs, things that people need to live. I just don't think you want that speculation to cross into those markets too much. And that's that's something we, one way or another, need to revisit in Australia. Okay. All right, uh, Cam, any, anything you want to stick your oar in on here? Yeah, look, I think um, I have a slightly different perspective there. Um, consider, consider if rental laws were very secure and just like we feel we don't need to own any farms to get our food reliably and cheaply, we didn't feel the need to own any houses to get our housing cheaply and reliably, uh, you know, the speculation would be fine, right? Because people would just, it would be sort of asset speculators like there are in share markets or, or bond markets or, or anything else. So I think it's important to differentiate here that buying property is always buying an asset you're always going to go and get into an asset market if you want to treat property differently from other assets you actually need some pretty heavy-handed rules about lending to real estate um, the the tenure rules around renting and being a landlord and your obligations so you actually um, you know, it needs some pretty heavy-handed heavy intervention, but the very, the general trend in Australia and in many countries is to go, well, no, property is an asset like any other. People should be able to buy and sell and do what they want. And, you know, that is fine under certain circumstances where you can opt out of this either by buying your own property or by renting and still being secure and, and not having uh, to move because your landlord is speculating and flipping properties. So I guess that's a slightly um, different view there. I, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any concerns about buying and selling property. And I think if you, if you don't like those outcomes, create a parallel alternative, um, you know, way for people to get housing, you know, public housing um, developer. Uh, lots of them exist around the world. So anyway, that's my thoughts. That, that might be true. I'll just, I'll just come in on that point. It, it might be true that to get back from where we are now, it would require quite severe laws, but the, the laws that got us to this point were just simply changing the tax treatment of property relative to what it had been before. So it didn't, it certainly didn't change laws in that way to get us to this point. It was just a change. Which, of the tax which ones do you mean specifically, Mark? Okay, well, well, well here I will games. indulge it. Yeah. Mark, maybe that, you want to do your whole history so, of tax sort of thing. I'll, I'll move that ahead. So there you go. I mean, certainly the there were there were there have been successive rounds. The the Ralph review where the capital gains was halved and you immediately had a property boom in the wake of that is the latest, maybe the latest significant change. But there have also been changes like the removal of land tax all the way back in the early nineteen fifties that favoured land as an asset class over things like labour, where the tax burden was shifted to. So you can, there's a whole lot of decisions, public policy decisions that have got us to this point. And they don't, I mean, yeah, it doesn't okay. necessarily yeah. equate to over-regulating markets or anything like that. Most of this happened just in the realm of tax. Uh, okay, well, tax I guess I disagree that, 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 that 
because I mean, think about think about pre pre World War Two. Uh, that was almost two centuries of boom and bust cycles in property, right? Um, and so to get out of that cycle required the post-war sort of heavy-handed regulation of property, lots of public intervention in those markets. If you look globally, there's plenty of countries that don't have the same tax breaks on property, but still have um, property booms and busts like we do. And remember that tax is something you pay anyway, right? So rather than borrowing to buy your million dollar house, if it's only half a million without the tax, but the tax you pay is equivalent to the interest on that extra half a million in cash flow terms, you know, it's it's much much of a muchness. Um, on the negative gearing, for example, uh, the number of landlords negative gearing has collapsed in the last decade because of the lower interest rates. So mm, yes. yes, the capital gains tax um, discount is clearly a big thing. But even then, if you do the numbers, you're talking about you know, 12 to 15% at different parts of the property cycle on the price. And you know, prices went up 20 plus percent this year already, right? And this tax has been around for, or the tax break's been around, I believe since 2000 or 1999. So, you know, the orders of magnitude of its overall effect just don't seem so large. I mean, consider New Zealand, for example. Uh, property prices went up 20% in the four weeks of February this year. So what we're saying is this great big tax reform can take prices back backwards three weeks in New Zealand. So, I, you know, clearly there's, there's the bigger picture of the interest rates. There's a bigger picture um going on here yes taxes have an effect but you've got to just keep the magnitude of that effect in perspective yes they would take 15 percent off across the board but you could have taken 15 percent off across 2000 to 2020 looked at the price patterns and we'd still be having this discussion and saying how unaffordable is this it's record high price to income so gentlemen just, I, yeah. I I do, do think we need to move on. And my gosh, I was originally thinking we'd cover all this terrain in an hour. I think I was obviously dreaming. Uh, you know, oh, what's yeah. that? The movie, The Castle, telling his dream. <laughs> anyway, but uh, but I, I suppose, who knows, maybe we need to come back and, and revisit this at some time. But what I will do now is I'll read out some questions and then after that we'll go to the land banking issue. So, um, so I will actually uh, go to a question by... Um, now, let me see. Jason's asked about low interest rates. That's fair enough. Okay. Kate asked about what do you guys think of medium density cities, e.g., seaside town Kiama, New South Wales, won't let developers build higher than four stories. This is to preserve the beauty of the area. Another interesting thing I've read about are ratios of private to public housing in new apartment buildings being required. Now, I'll also, at this point, I suppose, go and I think it's appropriate to uh, recite Tim's questions though they're big questions but anyway let, 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 I'll, I'll read through them and at least they're on on record whether or not we can you know, reply to them okay Tim saying why does Australia have higher housing prices in general than the US excepting a few places like New York even though population to land ratio is about 15 times worse than the US what role does the huge tax concessions given to owner occupiers play given the drop-off in investors in the housing market in recent years with the boomers retiring and in some years actual declines in outside outstanding loans to investors, how big a role do investors play now? And then another one, what are the incentives that drive land banking by developers? Um, okay, maybe we'll leave that for the land banking. Um, why does the government not implement the simple solution to the negative gearing rort, i.e. only allow a tax deduction for real interest, interest above inflation? Is it because they would then have to stop taxing nominal interest rates earned by taxpayers and thus the combined measures which would actually cost them money overall? And would they would and they would also have to stop in taxing inflationary increases in trading stock valuations and the component of capital gains that is fictitious because it only represents inflation and is that's not real. In fact, the, the much hated, I think he's saying, yeah, the much hated 50% CGT discount roughly only compensates for inflation in capital gains. How would abolish the inflation adjustments for capital gains taxes when he bought in the 50% discount? Would it be better to have an honest tax system that taxed only real post-inflation gains? All right, lot, lots of questions, but let's take it slowly 
Um, let's start off with Kate's question. What do you guys think of medium density cities, e.g. seaside town, Cam and New South Wales, that won't let developers build higher than four storeys? This is to preserve the beauty of the area. So I will make a, a general comment that uh, preempts some of our discussions of land banking that rather than developers not being able to build things of a certain story, there's a lot of land that's actually being held out of use. And we'll probably hear from Cam uh, further on in, about that sort of story. But yes, developers are limited, but there's also land being held out of use. But uh, Cam, Mark, did anything you want, want to say, say about that? Uh, I, I, this is sort of a political answer. I think it's a good thing that some communities in some areas can enact their will in that way. It's not as if, and it's a, there's an economic virtue to this in that it allows you to compare prices in those areas with prices where developers have more say. But I think if you believe in, in local government and the ability of communities to some extent to move in different directions and determine their own policy, I think it's a good thing. It's economically useful as well because it gives you that comparison. And it's certainly not going to cause any significant change in land prices over a whole state. I mean, Kaima has 12,000 people. Most of the communities that are doing the same thing are not much larger than that. It's a very, very minuscule proportion of land value across the state. And a very useful experiment in, in local democracy in, in how particular policies affect land prices. Cam, any, anything yeah. you want to add to that story? Yeah, yeah. I've got the list of questions here on Facebook. So let me just quickly go go through them. Um, so why does Australia have higher housing prices than the US for accepting a few places like New York, even though the population to land ratio is 15 times worse? Well, that's because the physical dimensions of property are in many ways unrelated to their economic value as an asset. Just because there's lots of land. I mean, there's lots of land in Australia. Go somewhere cheap if that's you know, if that's your argument, right? Um, because the, the proximity to other activities is what has value. Um, and so, yeah, just, just drop that, you know, physical dimensions of the world are important. I mean, you, you know, if you take that logic to its conclusion, you say, well, the existence of the earth, the earth's too small. If the earth was bigger, property would be cheaper. I mean, that's the end, end game with that sort of argument. So, <laughs> so think about it as a financial asset, right? That, that gets you thinking correctly. Well, you know, housing's an asset. It, it gives me a 3% return. What else can I do to get a 3% return? That could return can either come in the form of occupying the house and avoiding rent or from rent someone pays me, et cetera, et cetera. So think about it as a financial asset. Tax concessions on owner-occupiers. Well, you know, I think personally it's, it's good to have some kind of advantage to owner-occupation over investment. Um, I think there's some stability. This is like a dynamic, dynamic optimization there going on. That the stability of home ownership has has a social value. Um, I don't, I don't see it having a huge effect on price, given that investors are still willing to pay with with fewer tax concessions, as in they pay 50% capital gains instead of zero percent. The that the fact that they still exist means that those concessions aren't too generous or too distorting. Uh, the drop-off investors in the housing market in recent years, yeah, I'm, I've actually predicted that the census that we've all just completed in the last month will show the first rise in home ownership rates in Australia for, for a decade, uh, since the 2011 census, I think, um, because investors were absent the last four years. Part of that's due to the um, sort of what led up to the financial system inquiry. Uh, the result of that is that investor mortgages are, are a much higher premium over owner-occupier mortgages right now. Prices were falling for a couple of years, so investors weren't expecting those capital gains. They were cashing out on their previous gains, and it made the buy versus rent equation very favourable for first-home buyers. Uh, why doesn't the government implement a single, simple solution to negative gearing? I just don't see negative gearing as a major factor. You can do it if you like but I think capital gains tax has a bigger effect on price. Again, in that sort of 12 to 15% negative gearing, the price effect is, is you know, a, a few percent at most. Um, if, is that worth the effort? I don't know politically to change that rule. Uh, taxing nominal interest earned by taxpayers. Well, all tax applies to a nominal value. You know, I make an investment in my education just as I'd make an investment in property. And the return on that is my wages sometime in the future. Now, do I get to 
escalate the cost of my education and subtract that from uh, you know the wages no i don't so um, i don't think you should get too bogged down in that nominal versus real taxation um, so i'm going to skip the next one so the, the Howard's shift from inflation, inflation adjust, adjustment for capital gains tax to 50% sort of would have worked in the previous era, right? Where there was inflation <laughs> and there wasn't the huge divergence of prices, and especially in property. Uh, but the fact that it was implemented, uh, you know, about seven or eight years after the, the modern monetary policy regime of using lower interest rates to stabilize the economy was sort of bad luck if you think about it from a broad perspective so that that ended up being a massive giveaway um, what are the incentives that drive land banking well undeveloped land is also a financial asset okay just like developed land and it makes a return and it makes that return in the form of capital growth whether you've built a building or not and in fact by not building a building today so not building that four-story building um, you can build maybe a 10 story one in 10 years because once you've built that four story one you're not going to knock it down in five or ten years and build a 10 story one it's it's you know it's not going to be economical again for a long time so yeah undeveloped land is an asset when i strike my option to develop it i'm actually giving up one asset an undeveloped piece of land and i'm swapping that asset and some cash that i spend on construction to get a new asset which is a developed property and only if the return on that new bundle of assets exceeds the return on the old bundle of assets, is it even worthwhile doing, All right? So that's, that's sort of the logic behind land banking. The other, the other logic is developers aren't in the business of flooding the market and reducing the value of their assets, right? So there's an optimal rate for them, rate per period of time for developing. So there's an optimal density given a price if there were no rules about density. And there's also an optimal rate at which you would sell that density each period. Okay, and with the housing supply debate, essentially it's fundamentally confused. I'm just gonna say the whole debate is confused. I would say most people in the debate are confused. They're confusing density, the dwellings per unit of land with the rate of supply, put it this way, which is the rate of new dwellings per period of time regardless of their shape or density, okay? Just because you can build 10 stories instead of five stories doesn't mean you're gonna sell them twice as quickly. In fact, it's optimal to sell them at the same rate, but take twice as long. So keep that in mind. On the medium density, I think I skipped that first question. I'm a big fan of medium density. And in fact, and I'm also a big fan of people sort of preserving the character of their area. So. The way I see cities developing efficiently and effectively is by revitalizing industrial areas in what, be, what are becoming dense urban locations and actually allowing quite a bit of density. And also on suburban areas with large blocks allowing some, some middle density so you can get this townhouse density and people still feel like they're walking down suburbia without high rises everywhere. But also in new subdivisions, I'm actually a fan of allowing quite a lot of density, even though they might be located quite far from existing services. If you have a cluster of greenfield areas and they build townhouses and detached dwellings and have quite a bit of density, uh, it actually becomes very attractive to, to locate quite a lot of economic activity nearby as well. It also means that you don't end up having all these detached houses and then in 15 years time, that area is actually quite a lot more valuable and attractive and people want to live in apartments and townhouses there. Or they, you know, they're willing to pay at the right price. So I'm actually a big fan of allowing a little bit more density in Greenfield. And if you think about the terrace housing in most Australian capitals, the terrace houses were the Greenfield edge of the city, right? When they were built, they were quite dense, but they were the edge of the urban sort of area and so I sort of see that still being applicable now. So I hope I hit all those questions.
Okay, well, I think there was another one that Kate was asking. Another interesting thing I have read about are ratios of private to public housing in new apartment buildings being required. So this sort of hybrid development. Uh, now, Cam, Mark, do you have anything you want to comment on uh, there? This is a, a different, uh, I guess, a hybrid sort of uh, public-private development that they're looking at doing. Well, it's well, certainly uh, uh, good to address the up. problem, obvious problem that we have in Australia, which is the fairly rapid decline in public housing as a share of housing overall, which that that amplifies the problem of expensive housing that's the broader problem in the economy and, and creates quite serious losses for people who, who would rely on, on cheap housing um, as, as a, something essential for them to go about their life. Um, I agree with the point about density in greenfield housing as well. I think that's sort of related in a way. The fact that developers have so much incentive to bank land and hope for policy change that favours them, that that's explains a huge amount of the most insidious lobbying that goes on in the, particularly in the state governments. Um, and that, that has quite serious extractive effects on everybody else. So if you can, in, in a sense, more density in greenfield lobbying gets in front of that um, and makes it less likely that, that there's, there's incentives to encourage more density down the track. Cam, anything you want to add or is that, that fair enough? Uh, look, on the, on the mix of public housing, uh, I think uh, politically and socially uh, and collectively, we've, we've sort of given up on it. We're, we've decided that market housing is the only option. And it's quite interesting because if you look at home ownership rates in Australia, they grew from 50% to 70% through the 50s and 60s biggest rise in history and that wasn't because of market housing it was because of huge public housing there was rent control on landlords so that would encourage them to sell to owner occupiers um, there was public finance to build your own home there was a huge heavy-handed intervention and so i think what we've done is we've already forgotten how we got high high home ownership and now we're sort of pretending that the market's going to do what it rarely ever does and doesn't have the incentives for so on the mix of a so I'm very much pro, just like the health system. I, I like this analogy. We have a private health system, but we also have a public health system. And if this one's not working for you, you can take this one. Health is a sort of uh, a part of the economy characterized by monopoly characteristics. Um, it's a sort of really fundamental, important thing that everyone needs. So why don't we treat it the same? Why don't we let the private market do its thing, but also have this alternative option? And why don't we maybe foster some some other non-market price social housing, you know, community housing as well, and have this sort of ecology of alternatives? Um, there's, there's a few good examples of inclusionary zoning where private developers are uh, obliged to to hand over certain dwellings in developments to to a local uh, public housing agency. They're, they're never really that big, uh, even after decades. Very difficult them to get them to be substantial. Uh, I think the government is sort of mis misleading its, itself in many ways by thinking about the budget and not the balance sheet when it comes to housing. For example, uh, Land and Housing Corporation in New South Wales owns all the public housing stock. The value of its housing stock went from 30 billion in 2014 to 50 billion in 2019, just because of the property value increase, right? Now, it's, that's kind of funny because the government's also saying, you must self-fund, you know, you're such a drain on the budget. Hey, they just made you $20 billion by doing nothing. Right? Um, why is it that the New South government, New South Wales government's the only organisation that thinks it can't make money in Sydney property? Right? Why is it? So I think the public, the, we've got to get over that, and like we did with public health, just say, yeah, the private market does its thing and it has certain characteristics. We're going to plan and ensure the market works within the town plans and make sure they're flexible enough but that people still get a say, but we're also going to come here and you know what, we're going to be a bit active. And if that's not working for you, we've got an alternative, alternative as well. Um, so I think that's sort of a, a workable solution um, just to get that scale that you would need uh, from public housing. And the scale we did have, I think 15% of new dwellings through the 50s were, were public housing and it's been less than 2% in the last 25 years. So that's um, 
you know, sort of eight times higher. It's quite a lot. Okay. Well, all right. Well, we'll try to uh, continue some of the story now. Uh, I, I know Cam's actually got this sort of talked about land banking. I suppose there's obviously the developer land banking, but I mean, I do observe that there's a lot of, you know, properties, uh, blocks of land that are not utilised as you sort of walk around. So obviously there's individuals who have, for whatever reason, decided not to develop. And I, I do think there's this pool of undeveloped land and that it's a bit uh, manipulative of developers to say, oh, you know, there's not enough land being being pumped into the system when there's a lot of land there that isn't actually being built on and that includes you know developers with their developments but also individual blocks of land too and i, I suppose one other point i i thought i might make i know cam's actually made in his papers that there's a lot of abuse of numbers like the the developers want to maintain a list price but over time they include uh, they have extra inclusions which means that the effective price to people buying it is less but the book price is still the same. So they have this propaganda story about how valuable land is. And I mean, I've also heard stories about country towns where but really the rent should be lower, but rather than actually dropping the rents, what the landlords and real estate agents do is they give people extended rent-free periods before the actual rent itself starts. So there's a lot of abuse of the numbers that, that's sort of going on there. And I suppose what was another thing, I suppose we're talking about all the negatives, but I suppose it's worth reflecting that, you know, we do actually access the economy and live reasonable lives. And I guess there's a mixture of good and bad. I suppose if I had more time, I'd maybe go into that a bit more. Now, we have talked about history a bit. We've heard some of that. But one of the other stories is that CPI doesn't uh, capture uh, the increase in land values. And that obviously, I guess, if all you want to do is rent and, and, and have a place to live, that's one thing. But I do think it's uh, mischievous of government to sort of say, oh, things are going fine when really the property values are going up and they really should be reflected in CPI. So that's a sort of certainly a position I know that I've put forward and Andrew will have a question from Andrew later on. So because I know some people do talk about, you know, money printing, uh, you know, feeding asset price bubbles. I think, Cam, you were actually hinting at that earlier on with what, what you were saying. So, mm -hmm. um, so I suppose we also had uh, history and I think, uh, uh, Mark, you sort so of gave us some of that. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So, can I just quickly comment on the CPI? So, in 1997, yeah. um, the CPI method changed to remove the sort of asset component of housing and make it a consumer price. Just as we wouldn't put the share price of BHP in an index of mineral prices, we'd actually look at the price of the iron or the coal or whatever, the zinc. Um, that's also the way that it became treated for housing. So we put rent in there, we put the cost of construction in there, but the asset part we leave out because it's not an asset price index, it's a consumer price index. Now that's conceptually fine and it's consistent, but I just think people don't understand that that's what it's for, okay? There's not one price index to rule them all. There's a consumer price index. There's also a producer price index. There's also a cost of living index because it's not a cost of living index. There are various asset price indexes or indices. So just keep that in mind that, yeah, it's the price of the property asset is not in CPI because it's not meant to be. You have to look at so, so maybe maybe we should be, be focusing more on the cost of living index rather than let letting people get away with plotting out the CPI. Is that perhaps a, a fair thing to say? Well, that depends on what your purpose is, right? So the central banks like a consumer price index because they have a concept of inflation that is consumer prices, this basket of goods, right? And they want to manage the economy and understand what inflation is. If you're a welfare agency like Centrelink, you want to understand the cost of living, for example. Uh, housing's really tricky in a price index because there's a huge chunk of people that bought their house decades ago and all they do is pay the rates and insurance. Housing's free to them, right? So you still need to include those people in your measure of you know, the prices faced by society. Then there's renters who face the rental price and then there's new buyers and they face sort of the new price, either the construction and the land price, 
the asset price. And so you have to accommodate this sort of uh, this edge case in housing that, you know, not if everyone rented, it would be easy conceptually to know what the price is, but we don't have that. And we also have a huge chunk of the population that pay nothing because they're their own landlord, right? And there's no price that's recorded. So just, just something to keep in mind uh, when you're having this discussion. That's all. Okay, we can I, we'll can I just, just come we'll, in on that very quickly. Yeah, go ahead. It's perfectly true to say that CPI is not one index to rule them all, certainly not in theory, but the way that it's taken in practice as the basis for just about every welfare payment and pension and everything else, it's been made into that by the prism of politics, probably very unwisely. Yeah, okay, well, Mark, like I think that, that, that's, a valid that's a good point. Yeah. Um, okay, well, look, I, yeah. go I, I will go to Andrew's question. Let's have a look here. Um, actually, no, this, this, this is building on CPI. Maybe we've already answered it, but uh, no. All right, I'll, I'll hang on if I can actually read these questions. Okay, there's that. Okay, here's two questions from Andrew Downing, if I can have a look at it. The average cost of housing is accelerating away from the average income to buy them. Ultimately, this can't continue indefinitely and still have people in houses. So what's the answer? Maybe we should leave that for later on when we all talk about what the answers are, or maybe we should move it ahead and start talking about the answers. Okay, another thing is CPI gets treated as if it's a gross representation of inflation and applied as a cost of living in terms of things like wage increases. People don't build houses without land to build on, and that factors into the cost of existing houses. I think we've sort of more or less spoken about CPI, but um, gentlemen, anybody want to sort of uh, stick their oars in on, on those two issues? Um, we, we could just move yeah, on no, with the land, land's not in there don't don't look for land prices in cpi but i think people are missing the the bigger picture point is there's two ways to occupy housing you either rent a property or you rent if you don't have the money you rent the money or you reallocate the money to buy that out and on those terms housing is actually historically very cheap the cost of paying a bank interest compared to the cost of paying a landlord rent is relatively cheap right now. And that's why prices are going up. That's why we had record first home buying the last four years. So just keep that in the back of your mind, because in many cases, what, what people are doing, uh, they're thinking that they're bundling together an asset and a consumption good and saying, oh, it's expensive. Well, yeah, it's expensive, but you're buying a housing asset. It's, yeah, Apple shares are expensive if you buy a thousand of them. So, so what, right? Um, just, just keep your clarity of thinking on housing. Um, there's an asset, and then there's the actual cost per period of having housing, which is like a consumer price. I think that's just important to keep in mind. Okay, Mark, anything you want to add to that story? So I think I think there's a there was an important point then about the the fact that house prices have accelerated away, increasingly away from the average person's ability to fund them, and that's that's quite, ah, yes, yes. that's an insidious situation, right? Because uh, in a, a very large mortgage that you pay for decades is something like a private land tax, except that you'll pay it on top of income tax instead of substituting for income tax, which is what ideally would happen. And places like Singapore and Denmark, which at least for periods of time did have quite substantial land taxes, were able to overcome the property boom and bust cycle. The only times where it's ever really happened was in places where there was a substantial comprehensive land tax. And, and what happens if, if you don't have that land tax and, and you in fact go the, to the opposite situation where you encourage speculation on land, you, you create a private land tax instead you force the interest rates down because otherwise you, you get a situation where you can create temporary affordability by pushing the interest rates down but then they're stuck there because there's so much political capital invested in keeping the interest rates low and, and, and not reducing people's asset value it, it traps us then in a low savings high speculation economy that's what low interest rates does and that all of this it's, it's very subtle. It works outside of the headlines and people's ability to see what's happening, but it's, it's also very serious and it's, it's become normative, but it didn't, it didn't need to be 
land tax would be an immense fix for the problems we've been building up over decades and maybe even over centuries of time. Okay, well, well let, let's say, I guess, believe it or not, we are reaching the end, end of things. And I guess the idea that we are ever going to have just time to just chin wag about things, I don't think that, that, that that's obviously not going to happen. But I, I know Mark told us a bit of the story of um, some of the history of taxation, which we heard earlier. Now, I know there are some recent changes in um, Victoria where they've got a vacant property tax, and I think they're starting to implement a, a betterment tax or something like that. But, uh, again, I'm a bit vague on, on the details of what's been going on in Victoria. But I know, Cam, you have had, a, I guess, a historical interest in betterment tax and perhaps know about you know what's going on in Victoria. So is that a, a story that you can add to at this point? You could just say, yeah. oh, we've talked to, for too long and it's not relevant or something like that, if you like. It's up to you. <laughs> I'll just briefly uh, explain what it is, maybe. Um, so, okay. uh, you know, think of, when you think about property, uh, we've talked a lot about housing. What we should think about is that we've carved up the surface of the earth into three-dimensional chunks. Like jelly, we've cut out three-dimensional pieces and we've called them property. And this is how we've got over our conflict of views. We've said this three-dimensional space is yours, that three-dimensional space is yours. And that's what property is. You can exclude people uh, from that space. Now, our laws define those boundaries. And one of those laws is zoning. And it might define the height or the setback or whatever the case may be in that three-dimensional space. And if you rezone and go, oh, yeah, you can build 10-story building here on this four-story zoned property what you're actually doing is you're saying well i own this cube of property above me is this cube of air that the public at large owns and i'm getting it for free now now i can keep everyone out of that space whereas previously it was collectively owned um, and so what we should do and, and the point being is that airspace right has a value right because you can build into it if you're the owner of the cube of three-dimensional space underneath and you can sell what you build for more than what it costs you to build it and that leftover bit is the value of that space and this can be an enormous um, for example in in sydney the the additional space to build an additional dwelling is probably worth five hundred thousand dollars per dwelling so if you can build a story with eight dwellings extra above the plan you're looking at four million dollars of value for that that extra bit of airspace and that's why developers are so keen on waiting for the planning system to change, holding these land banks and waiting for those airspace rights to be given to them or lobbying for them actively because they get that windfall value on their balance sheet without ever having to get the tools out and build a building. They can then go and take that new piece of air that they own and on sell it to someone else and just take it as cash if they like, and many do. So betterment is that value of that space that we give from the community when we change the zoning rules. And a betterment tax is just literally saying we should sell that value. Just like we wouldn't give the next door property, you know, just like we wouldn't sell a park next to a building to the, that building owner and say, you just build on this park if you need extra space, we'll give it to you for free. We shouldn't also sell the air rights that we own collectively above their three-dimensional space. Uh, we should tax them or sell them. And so a betterment tax is just saying that has a market price. We'll find out what that price is and we'll tax a, a big chunk of it to, sh to get that value back to the community. But you can sell the rights. Uh, New York has an air rights trading system. Uh, they say, well, actually, uh, you, you guys, we're just giving it to you. You all own it. And if you're not going to build in it, you can sell it to someone else. Um, and Sao Paulo and Brazil actually auctions from the public the additional square meterage of rights to build at high density in certain targeted redevelopment areas. And that's just like selling that public value. So that's one of the solutions to a lot of the controversy in my view around zoning and lobbying um, and land banking is that fine, we can rezone however we like, but we're gonna charge for it. So that's the fairest way we can do it. And that's gonna reduce the incentive to lobby councils we know there's a big issue with corruption in councils and planning decisions um, and even if you do favor your mate with a planning decision the public's going to get a huge chunk of that value back so that's my story on betterment <laughs>
Okay. But Mark, anything you want to throw in or we, we, could, we could continue moving on? I think you gave a lot of the story about taxation earlier, so I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I, I agree with everything we just heard then. I think betterment tax would be one of the best tax reforms that we could possibly implement given where we, where we are in the, in the current land cycle. And given what the history is, I think it would be an excellent uh, Victoria be, is dipping yeah. their toe into it. Sorry, I yeah. forgot to add, Mark. Yeah, and there is a uh, version. We've got to of, wait and see on the details. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there's a version of it in the ACT. It works quite well. Okay, well, actually, we might start to move things towards a conclusion. Now, I suppose when I started this, it all seemed very simple and straightforward. But as as this has progressed, it's all got very complicated. So I can only say that that. I guess I do believe this will eventually end up on YouTube. So I'll certainly have another look at it. And I was one of the people hosting it. So uh, there, there's been a lot, lot of interesting stuff discussed and, uh, you know, that that's been good. But, but I guess we're moving to a conclusion. And, you know, we've heard some of the story about what is the problem now. Uh, I think Mark and Cam have sort of hinted at it. I'll actually read out a quote by Saul Eslake. But there's this fundamental tension between saying, that uh, you know, we want to increase housing affordability, but people who already have an asset want to maintain the value of that asset. And I think there's a fundamental clash between those two things and it works out in the political system and people tell lies and people tell stories and some of them get away with it. And for me, that's a lot of the problem. Now, I think Mark will probably give his some of, he's already given some of his ideas of the solution and maybe we'll hear a bit more from Mark, but I think Mark's talking about land value taxation. But let me read from a quote from uh, uh, Saul Eslake, who uh, the, 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 the Cam did actually cite approvingly, as they say, for all the crocodile tears which politicians of all persuasions routinely shed about the difficult facing those wishing to get their first foot on the property ladder, deep down they know that there are far more people who already own at least one property and who therefore have a very strong interest in policies which result in continued property price inflation than there are those who don't but who would like to and opening brackets, and who would prefer, at least until they succeed in their aspiration, policies which would restrain the rate of property price inflation. But yes, I guess we'll bring things to a close. And the issue is closing comments. How do you think we fix this problem? Maybe we've already said it, said that story in bits and pieces along the way. But uh, Cam, maybe you'd like to sort of uh, closing comments. How do we fix all this? Yeah, look, I, I think the big picture view is in terms of the private market and the pricing of property, while we have this monetary policy system of stabilising the economy through lower interest rates, we're going to have this problem with property asset pricing. Uh, that's almost unavoidable unless there's some kind of really uh, strict controls on who can borrow money for houses so that we can have a quantity limit instead of a price limit. So I think we're in a little bit of a pickle there. And therefore, I'm a big fan of this healthcare model, having a public alternative where anyone who doesn't own property can show up and buy a, a new apartment or a new townhouse somewhere in the suburbs from an agency at essentially the cost of construction. Uh, and I think if you had that alternative, um, you know, people would use it. Uh, look at in, in Singapore, for example, I think over 90% of dwellings were publicly built because that's essentially the system they, they created half a century ago, and it's been hugely successful. And I think Australia, if we have in mind the healthcare model, private market works for a lot of people, but when it doesn't, you've got this public option. Uh, I think that's where we should be headed in our thinking on housing. Okay, Mark, any, any more comments? Now, there are one or two questions that I think we should get to before we properly close things. But Mark, Mark any sort of, uh, I think you've basically said uh, land value taxation would be a good thing, but, but are any more closing comments or, or answers to the problem that you want to make? Yeah, I'll develop that slightly. So a land value tax, meaning a tax purely on the unimproved value of the land, that which means just just the physical land, not the buildings and dwellings that are on the land. Because if you tax, the entire value of course you, dis you you discourage development of the land which might not be what you want but a tax just on the land value is is one of the best 
it, it, it hits the problem in a whole lot of different places. So, I mean, un, unlike other taxes, land value tax doesn't do anything to discourage work or enterprise. It just encourages better use of land. It, it discourages hoarding. It brings idle land into the market, which might be that, that, that extra supply would do a lot to bring down the price and, and create opportunities to reduce homelessness. It suppresses the, the explosive land cycle. The, the, the speculative cycle that pushes up the price of land and then and then sometimes not in Australia but it, in some places crashes the price of land in in successive recessions and, and boom cycles um, it it encourages development of public transport because it public transport increases the value of land and if government has a stake in the value of land it has an incentive to build public transport it it reduces the tax burden on regions relative to cities because so much of the land value is locked in cities. It, it, and it also, it, it can be done even in an opt-in way where people could pay land tax in lieu of income tax by their own choice and sign certain types of bonds to the government, which would reduce effectively to nil. If you, if you lock up the entire rental value of land in tax, the, the market value of that land could drop very, very low. And you could create a situation where people are paying simply land tax rather than what we have now, which is private land tax in the form of mortgage levied on top of income tax. So you could enormously reduce the cost of living. And fundamentally, you're correcting a wrong which was done a long time ago because a land value tax is a tax on exclusion, on the right of exclusivity over land. And ultimately, it, it, it corrects something we did a long time ago in the area of the land enclosures, when the commons was basically taken away by, by governments of that time. And it aligns the tax system to the fundamental principle that we all have a right to the earth, which we lost, we were lost access to so much of that a long time ago. But if you use the land tax to fund something like a basic income, you give everyone a share of the value of the commons. And the, the, the tax that you pay would be determined by how much of the commons you want to enclose, but the, the money you get back would be the same for everybody because everyone's being denied access to the commons equally by the existence of enclosures and, and land enclosure and that sort of thing. So it fixes potentially a very old economic injustice and provides a much more human safety net potentially than the welfare system that we have now. And that, that okay. makes sense, you know, the, the 42, the answer to everything in terms of a lot of the current, the, the deepest flaws in our economic system of today. Okay, I, I know being a virtual Tim Josling, he would probably sort of start to start to talk about capital gains tax as compared to land value tax, and you know, is the government double dipping? And those are the sort of questions he would ask. But uh, as I say, I'm being a virtual Tim Josling and, and struggling a bit. But that's just one of the things that I know some people would bring up. But let's go to uh, the last questions, if I can actually. Uh, scan through this and gentlemen you're welcome to have a look at the the uh, Facebook feed as well but here we go with uh, Kate saying is pricked up when Cam mentioned people had owned housing for decades and only pay council rates in aged care I've seen a lot of people not moving out of their huge family homes in desirable suburbs because it would affect them getting or retaining their pension also has to do with high stamp duty now, Andrew has uh, said here, following Cameron's logic there, we all end up with land owned by an asset owning class and a separate renter class who rent the use of land from them and could never afford to bridge the gap. Um, uh, Solo Recruits is saying, right to enter and right to clean for banks when they're leasing the property to you and a blanket disaster levy. I can't quite make sense of what Solo Recluse is saying there. But uh, yeah, two questions from Kate and uh, Andrew there, if you gentlemen would like like to sort of, uh, and then maybe we will bring things to a close. I, I hope, uh, I, I, I hope, uh, I, I hope we can do that. But yeah. anyway, uh, Jen, go ahead. Uh, the age pension, the age pension and selling selling a house is a tricky one. Um, I mean, the age pension is is structured in a way to not force people out of their homes. Um, so, uh, look, I, I don't know what what the best thing is. I, I mean, I don't have a problem with the system how it is. If you cash out a house and it made you a million dollars, 
you don't pay capital gains on it and there you don't then you don't get the pension but you've got a million dollars i'm fine with that i don't i don't have a, a major concern um about that issue on the other issue about um, the inevitable conclusion is that we will all be renters and there'll be this corporate landlord class well maybe look in the us there's a lot of uh financial firms looking at residential housing as an investment class and becoming sort of corporate landlords um, and that's sort of fine uh, like, like, look it, it all depends on the distribution if we all owned one share in the company that owned every house then we'd be fine right we'd get the profits right just as if we owned one share in the property system um, by owning our individual house so it's you know you've got to um, think about it distributionally in many ways as well i i think home ownership is great <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's a worrying trend. I think what we're seeing in the U S with, um, with large finance, financial institutions, looking at housing as, as an asset residential property and housing of all types as an asset class, uh, it could be a, a very interesting shift. This next property cycle worth keeping an eye on. Mark, anything you want, want to add there or, uh. I, I just just a point on the fact that there's this there's an incentive for people in pensioners to hold on to housing assets relative to other assets. It does suggest that certainly a lot of politicians who talk about treating housing like any other asset do not seem to do that in this particular sphere. So clearly, most of us can see that there is a difference between some types of assets that are contingent or inherent to human dignity and the human right to live there is sometimes a need to recognize the difference in those types of assets and all of our systems around the age pension recognize that so it's not as if treating it differently would be something we don't already do well mark one thing i'll, I'll throw in that that has occurred to me is that you know in terms of the basics of life you know we talk about you know food water and shelter and in a sense, having shelter is one of those fundamental things. But you know, in our market, we obviously buy and sell property, and we're several steps removed from that fundamental starting point. So I don't know where that observation gets us, but uh, somehow I, I see this gap between you know, you know food, water, and shelter, and the system in which we we work, in which we operate, where you know property land where you live is sort of bought and sold. But I know Solo Recluse has, has talked about right to enter, read, lead, read, right to repair, subsidised repair provided by the bank like RACV, incentive to replace all energy systems in a house cannot possibly be paid by individuals. So I suppose he's thinking that, that bank loans should perhaps uh, help with repair. And uh, certainly I guess you can actually take out a loan to uh, replace your energy and you would hopefully have savings which would let you pay off that loan. But I guess that's a, a somewhat different issue to like housing uh, uh, and affordability. And I guess we were talking about just having a meandering talk about other economic issues, but I guess we've taken probably longer than an hour to do. And uh, yeah, maybe I've got to, got to pick my battles a bit more carefully next time. But uh, look, if there is sufficient interest, we might well hold another economic discussions, we'll see. I mean, I think that's been very rich and I will certainly uh, want to go back and sort of hear what we've talked about. Because as I say, I went into this thinking this is all very simple and straightforward and well, it ain't so simple and straightforward now that we've reached the end of it. But uh, but anyway, Dr. Cameron Murray and Mark, look, thank you very much for uh, attending and uh, uh, for everyone who's been having a listen and making the comments, thank you very much. And uh, I can but say in the Pirate Party, we're obviously trying to think uh, laterally, objectively, in a sort of balanced sort of way about economics where we're not pandering to a particular, particular sector or vested interest. So we are trying to work our way past that. But by golly, things get complicated quickly, don't they? Um, but we, we, we do our best, I suppose. And uh, I would like to think that, that things are a little bit clearer now that we've reached the end of this session. So anyway, Mark, Cam, thank you very much for, for, for attending. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks All right. So me. we'll bring... You're welcome. So. Uh,
Uh, Mandrake, I think you're there in the background. So, um, okay. So, uh, so anyway, Mandrake, look, thank you for your technical support. I realise we were struggling to get things going at the start, but I suppose in the same principle, we we hopefully learn from our mistakes and get better. So we hopefully will get better and better at running these uh, forums in the future. So uh, so anyway, Mandrake, I'll, I'll leave you to sort of turn things off. And uh, yes, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you everyone for watching. I, I hope you found it worthwhile and productive.